Hello everyone, my name is Barry Laird and I'm a freelance film and television location manager. I've been in the film and television industry since 2004, working my way through a variety of different departments until I eventually landed in the department which I'm currently in, in 2009-2010, which is the locations department, where I subsequently worked my way up the ladder to being location manager. Now, the locations department has a fundamental role in any production, whether it's television, feature film or advert, because essentially we are the face of the production for the public. And actually we are the conduit between our location and the production itself. And we have to work as a unit in the sense that we have to creatively match a director's vision, as well as make it logistically possible for any filming permissions to take place in the first instance. Um, now, the locations in which a film or a TV production is set has a huge impact on the production itself. How it looks, how it feels, does it match the story, and just subsequently how the actual production is going to take place as well. I've been fortunate in the sense, in the time that I've been doing this, to have worked on a variety of different productions, from feature films, such as Outlaw King, to Tell It to the Bees, to TV productions, such as Susan Hill's Ghost Story, or what it was originally called being The Small Hand, Deadwater Fell, uh, The Nest, Demon Headmaster, to name but a few. Now, all of those productions that I've just mentioned were very, very fortunate to have looked at in the Stirling district. Some of which I was hoping that I could bring the production to the district unsuccessfully. Some of which definitely did though. And in the coming videos, I'll be able to explain to you in detail what the, the, the reasons for looking at these areas were why we chose to look at that place and subsequently why we chose not to film there in some cases, and just giving you a little bit more of an insight about how these productions made their decision making, whether that was from a, a budgetary reason, a creative vision, or any other, other ones that come to mind. Now, one of the reasons that I like to offer up Stirling as a district to any production is, first and foremost, we have a lot of productions that always tend to film in the big cities like Glasgow and Edinburgh because that's a very natural place for a production to be based. Mm -hmm. However, one of the key elements of my role is to try and creatively show something that's never been shown before to a director and designer to excite them but still be creatively stimulated by myself. And sometimes it's nice to show them things that they wouldn't automatically think of. If, for example, you're looking for stately properties, beautiful landscapes, forestry, residential properties. You can find all of these things out with of Glasgow, but they have a different look and it shapes the way a production will be. It's one of the reasons that filming in the district is very, very appealing because it offers up so many different things for any production that you're working on. Plus, and this is always a key point, it's very, very close to airports, it's very, very close to both cities, and it's very, very commutable. It's film friendly, and it's one of the joys of actually coming to the district anytime I ever actually am fortunate enough to bring something to there. Um, good example of recent times was the, the Small Hand. That entire production, apart from four days, was filmed in the district. And the reason that happened is the key locations that we had to make that script work in such a short period of time it was found in the area and not only was it very very rewarding to actually find that place it's the look of a director's face it's the look on a designer's face and the the writer when they actually find that key place which was a ghost house on that particular example and i'll tell you more about that in detail when i go into that but those are the things that are very very rewarding every single day on this job is different doesn't matter how many times you've done the same types of production, every single one will throw you something completely different and that's one of the reasons why we keep coming back. And to film in the districts that are very film friendly like Sterling, it's always a joy to do so because they actively want to help you. They want to encourage filming and that is always a welcoming thing for any big event such as that. Because we do tend to bring a lot of people there but you also want to actively encourage things to be visually stimulating in that sense. And I look forward to telling you some more stories in the coming videos.
During my time as a location manager, I've worked on a few projects which I've either tried to encourage to film in the Stirling District or been fortunate enough to film in the Stirling District. Some of which I've done right from the very beginning of pre-production all the way to the very end of shooting. And some of which I've had to jump onto the project as it's already filming. The one I'm going to talk about now, I started right from the very beginning of its process. From the moment I was given the phone call to pre-production, to reading the script, to actually finding the locations and actually getting to the point of filming. And this was from Two Rivers Media, which was their first official drama project. And this was called The Small Hand, which was later retitled Susan Hill's Ghost Story. I was initially contacted with regards to this project just to see if I would be interested or available. I was then sent a copy of the script and immediately what was very, very prominent within the actual story was a ghost house. Now, in order to make the script and the translation to the film work, we had to find the, the hero house, the, the, the ghost house. I, I will refer to it as the hero house. And it was more or less described as a derelict stately property uh, with a spooky environment around it more than anything else. And I've filmed before in quite a few different kind of stately properties and very much aware that these are very, very manageable. However, in order to make it look a particular way, uh, it would take a lot of time and a lot of effort to dress the property to look that way, to look abandoned, to look empty. So it was going to be a challenge right from the get go. However, as this was Two River Media's first proper drama, uh, they didn't have a lot of time and they didn't have the the huge pot of gold that uh, is normally sitting there on kind of projects uh, from main networks or high-end feature films. So already there was a creative challenge in order to try and make this work with limited resources and limited time. And in the process, I had, I think, close to four weeks to uh, try and get, if not all of the locations identified, but certainly the, minor the majority of them. Um, and we knew for a fact that, uh, given the major page counts uh, within the script, that uh, the ghost house had to be found very, very quickly. And I went through my own database of kind of locations that I was already aware of and sat and took the director around for you know, quite a time. Uh, I, think we, I think we visited multiple locations over a five day period and we just could not find this house. And then um, just from basic research, uh, I happened to find a, a property uh, at Bannockburn House. And uh, initially I, I just read up on it because uh, oddly enough, the video that I found for it was on, uh, was on YouTube uh, as a haunted house. And um, I managed to uh, source some contacts for it, well, certainly some phone numbers for it. And then my initial approach was very, very straightforward. I tried to give a phone call, nothing uh, was being picked up on that point. And this was a, a Friday and uh, I was hoping to, to revisit with the director on the Monday or the Tuesday if I could to, uh, to try and kind of, you know, pinpoint this property. So I couldn't get anybody on the phone and I remember jumping into the car and driving the, the 20 minutes to there and there was a, a, a host of activity going on at the property. Uh, what I didn't realise at the time was that uh, they were organising for an event on the Saturday Sunday. So everybody was already in full swing and um, I, I just happened to speak to the right people at the right time when I arrived and they were very, very kind enough to just allow me to go around the property and photograph it. And the minute I walked through the door, I knew instantly that if I, if my director didn't like this, then, uh, you know, I was never going to find anything better because again, uh, with any types of these productions, when you have uh, a limited time frame, limited budget and everything else, our production office was based in Glasgow, so as a rule of thumb, everything had to be within 45 minutes. And this was just on the cusp of it. But I knew if I found this property in particular, then we could build the rest of the scripts, uh, the rest of the locations from the script in and around there to make things work. And uh, 
again, I, they were very, very kind enough to, to show me around the uh, the property. It was a, a committee uh, who run the, the facility now. And I took a raft of photographs and I pinged them across. And I think it must have been within 20 minutes of emailing the photographs to the designer and the director. Um, I remember being on the phone to the director and he was very, very excited about this. Uh, to the point that I made arrangements to take him out on the Tuesday. But what I also did was I'd also arranged to have a look at a few other properties, some churches and everything else, just to try and sell this uh, as a package. Uh, so if, if we like Bannock Barn House and we were going to film there for 12 days of a 21 shooting day schedule, then, oh, hang on, there are other screens, uh, there are other scenes that uh, take place in certain other locations here. So why don't we look at these while we're at it and I remember building a day of uh, location scouting uh, with the director uh, looking at various country roads various kind of cottages churches and uh, I was fortunate in the sense that the people at Bannockburn House were not able to uh, to allow me to look at the property until four o'clock so I made sure that this was going to be the last thing that the director saw that day so uh, we we spent a good six hours driving to a whole host of places and, and it just seemed to be a, a very, very good day because uh, we ended up finding another property for one of the other sketches. We ended up identifying a couple of kind of churches and country roads and then and the final location, quite literally, was we pulled up. I remember the designer had taken me out uh, a photograph of uh, a reference that she had used for what she thought the house was, and it actually was a, an exterior photograph of Bannockburn House. So I literally uh, I just couldn't contain my grin, you know, because I knew full well by the time that we were walking in there that uh, that they were already thinking about using this place before I even made a decision. So it, uh, that, it, it very rarely happens that you get a scenario like that where you managed to tick so many boxes in the one go. So it, it felt like this was a uh, not only a great day, but very creatively stimulating and very much one of those kind of situations where like all of a sudden we were all thinking, yeah, we can actually do this now. Uh, we actually have the blueprints of where we want to film the majority of this. There were still certain things that we still had to find, but the crux of the, the script we'd already looked at locations that the director and the designer thought and started stimulating conversations. So those are always good signs. So after the recce that we had done, uh, it was the next day, if I recall correctly, I just started making contact with everybody, just letting them know we'd love to come and film here. We don't know the specific dates because obviously there's so many moving parts that we need to put the the jigsaw pieces together but again just notifying everybody of the interest of wanting to do it and then obviously contacting uh, you know uh, the film liaison officers as well as all of the other elements just to let them know that I was confident that we were going to be able to bring this production uh, to the district more than anything else and then just begin the process of okay so we want to film on the Crow Road for example so in order to do that we need to get traffic management, we already do that, but I need to put things in writing, I need to get the paperwork, or if we're planning on doing any drone work, or if we were planning on doing any kind of landfill sites for our facility vehicles and stuff, all of those little elements, we started just building the process more involved. But again, at that stage, it was a simple case of having all of the, uh, the materials at hand and then just trying to put things into a logical order. So we, ended up going to Bannockburn House a couple of times before uh, filming started just because obviously we knew that our time was very very limited on the schedule because we only had 21 days to, to to film this production and we knew that it, it takes a coordinated effort to to get things in place that when you show up you are maximizing the amount of time because 21 days is not a lot of time uh, to film a two-hour feature film TV drama. Uh, normally something like that you could at least I'd imagine probably double that. Uh, I've been on productions where uh, you know I've been on the for 20 weeks to shoot a two-hour film so to have 21 days to do this was remarkably ambitious but you know I'm always interested and the script 
that are given to me more than anything else to kind of work on. Uh, sometimes you're fortunate in the sense that uh, you know you can jump onto those big scale productions and have every single toy available to you that makes the process easier. But when you don't have the resources and you don't have the time, uh, you have to find creative ways to solve problems. So we began obviously kind of putting a wish list together of everything that we wanted to do. And uh, the people at Bannock Bar House were so accommodating and so friendly and just willing to make this happen because we were the first thing that had really filmed there. Uh, or broad well, certainly a broadcast, I know they'd had stills and everything else there as well, but it was just such a joy to deal with them. Uh, and because we knew that we were going to be there for so much time, uh, it was an interesting learning experience from for them as well because um, as soon as one production comes into town more than anything else you tend to have a, a reaction because we all as location colleagues and managers we all speak to each other and um, I know specifically um, that when we had finished filming our end there I uh, with the the appropriate permissions from the people at Bannerburn House um, I forwarded on my images and contacts onto a couple of my other colleagues who I knew were looking for other things and I do believe that another project uh, filmed there more or less a couple of months thereafter uh, which was really really encouraging to hear but with regards to that uh, job we filmed at Fintry Kirk as well uh, we filmed up and down the Crow Road uh, there were a couple of uh, properties as well that we kind of looked at, um, which never actually made the final cut, uh, oddly enough, more than anything else. So again, we were dealing with a committee for Bannockburn House, but for Fintry Kirk, uh, obviously we're dealing with the, the people that run the church. But on a scenario like that, because it's a, a, a very, very small village and, you know, the traveling circus of 60 people in a crew is going to show up, you want to to make sure that there are no surprises because you know everybody should be given due notice that we're going to be arriving and what tends to happen is we put together a, a notification letter just saying that we hope to be coming to film on x y and z whatever the date was this is the level of activity we're going to have and on that one in particular because we had uh, some exterior filming there was scenes that required our actors to kind of walk out towards the main road and the church itself the, the kirk itself is literally on a main road so we needed to be able to control the traffic for a small period of time so again it's just notifying the residents that you know we'll have traffic management in place it's just elements like that it's just I, i'm a firm believer in the broad sense of just communicating things to people so that they're not taken off guard they're not surprised by any of these elements it's more a case of just being able to have the information to hand and then if they have any problems or queries they can either come directly to me or they can always come directly to a representative from the council which we always put on one of the letters as well i do that as a rule of thumb for every uh, district that i go and film in, in the area but again uh, going back to that particular project uh, it was hugely ambitious it was uh, anchored by the sense that we knew we had to film so much in so little time and uh, my memories of that particular production were just countless phone calls and countless rewrites of the script to try and simplify it down. Um, yeah, and just knowing that uh, you know, we were we were making something on limited time, but again, it, it's elements like that that. I find really, really stimulating. Um, I, I'll tell you in another video, but I've been on other jobs that have had far bigger uh, lengths, of that, far bigger budgets and far bigger degrees of kind of pre-build and production uh, times to kind of put everything together. And they don't always run in sync the way that you want them to. So, but yeah, uh, again, for that particular job, because we filmed for so much of the shoot in the district, I, I just made a point of kind of liaising everything back and forth with the appropriate people from the council to the residents to everybody else and just a clear line of communication even to the point that the, the liaison officers are always happy to I, I'll always offer them the opportunity to to come out and see what we're doing and everything else as well because it, it's, a, it's a good process for them to come out and see what's going on as well uh, because you know it, it, it's a window for them to to see what's going on because obviously you know 
they want to kind of see the fruits of our labor more than anything else and know that we're doing everything that we can to to show this in a great light more than anything else however um lovely job and, and i've spoken again uh with the director quite a few times for it and again every time that i uh i've seen or had conversations the same thing always comes up that uh without that particular property uh we would never have been able to make that film more than anything else so uh, great success Hello, uh, I'm here to uh, answer a few questions which have just recently come in. Uh, one of which, uh, from a teenage resident, uh, is I would like to work in the film and TV industry. Uh, would you recommend location management as a career? And how would I go about becoming one? And are there any courses that I can take? Well, it's a good question. Um, what I would say to that is, yes, I would recommend becoming a location manager or certainly working in that department. Um, because personally i find it to be the best of both worlds um because we act as a, a kind of a conduit between uh, a production and the location representative uh, you do get to see this both sides of everything because at the end of the day you're you're the face of the production you are the representative of the production on the on the ground more than anything else so not only is it very very creative because you have to find and facilitate uh, a whole host of different things for the TV production, film production, adverts or anything else, because at the end of the day, you're essentially providing the, the landscape for everybody else to be working from. Uh, it's also a very, very challenging job. Uh, very, You need to be very, very organized and good to kind of work with the public and people in general, because at the end of the day, uh, you are essentially trying to to convince people in a sense that uh, you know you're wanting to encourage filming to take place at their particular uh, property or you know whatever that turns out to be whether it's residential uh, restaurant public house or farm or anything else like that so yeah again it is a it is an interesting and challenging thing because every single job is completely different and it doesn't matter if it's the same type of location that you're looking for the, the fundamentals of it are, are fine but everything uh has to be applied in a different manner because just because one thing worked for one director doesn't mean it's going to work for the next so you always have to 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 be kept on your toes and think about it but again you have to be extremely organized with it as well so there's a lot of logistics planning because it is essentially event management is in, in the sense that what we do so the, the, there's an amalgamation of you know one minute you're in a stage and the next thing you know you're a, an engineer trying to figure out how to to get a raft of big trucks through a, a very very narrow gate there's logistic plans about whether or not you can close down residential streets or city centers or how it is to actually get equipment onto point a to point b there are so many different aspects of the job which are all very very fascinating um really long hours though uh so that's one thing that i would say um and if i were you uh, what i would say is get yourself onto a set uh and then just watch what everybody else does and then assess what uh what the job is that you would want to do if you have an interest in film and tv career there are another a number of ways that you can go about doing it certainly for training for locations uh the nfts uh offer great courses uh and teaching people how to do uh, relevant roles more than anything else there are a whole host of directories as well um, film bang focus to name but two and again you know what uh, what you find is that most people coming into the industry will get the contacts from these books and from these listings on the internet and actually just start making contact with the relevant people uh, entry level more often than not is runner uh, whether that's production assistant director art department or you know potentially being a marshal for the locations department but again there are key things that you will need to have driving license absolute paramount you need to have that because given the locations aspect of our job it's not something that you can rely on in public transport if only it were but again that is a, an invaluable qualification to have 
uh, because you know uh, at the drop of a hat you'll be asked to go off and do something and we have to kind of respond to it more than anything else is as well but veering back onto the point yes i would highly recommend it and uh, there are definitely courses to do as well as directories and everything else is as well um, if you're keen on doing it again voluntarily offer yourself to to come and watch what's going on just even shadow or anything like that or if you're very very fortunate enough that uh, you get uh, paid on your first position more than anything else but yeah again just tenacity is the key to that one more than anything else because uh, you know uh, there is a lot of the uh, doors that will be closed or uh, i remember vividly from uh, starting at the very beginning um however uh, stick with it if it's something that you really want to do and even just once you've found yourself on a tv production set an advert or a film or something like that you'll get a better sense as to uh, to what we do and you know and hopefully you'll enjoy it because it can be very very exciting apart from bannockburn house uh what's your favorite sterling location um i don't necessarily know if it's uh, my favourite Stirling location, uh, similar to Bannockburn House actually, but uh, the Stirling viewpoint, uh, the Wallace Monument, I I have very very fond memories of that, uh, purely uh, from the perspective that it was the first locations job that I ever did, and it was the first locations area. It was the first one that I'd actually kind of filmed that in that particular role uh, that we had permission to do. So this was um, 10 years ago, actually, uh, this month uh, for a BBC production called Freedom, um, which was a pilot uh, they were hoping to get commissioned. Um, and unfortunately, it never actually did come to anything. But there are a couple of other areas that I like filming at, and one in particular that just because of the sheer look of the, the location and maybe because I've actually spent a lot of time filming at MOD sites, um, Bandif, which is a, an abandoned depot, um, it just has a very atmospheric feel about it. Um, I've tried to get a couple of productions to kind of go there before. Um, SES, Who Dares, Who, uh, SES, Who Dares Wins, uh, I Survived the Zombie Game Show, to name but two uh, particular productions. And again, the reason it's interesting to me is because when you step on there, you know there's a, a, a good story waiting to be told there. That it's, it's remarkably bizarre to, to see all of these particular locations just lying abandoned. And again, uh, I'm hoping that I can bring something to there as well. But again, you know, I, I've done quite a bit of filming uh, in the district and quite a bit of scouting as, as well. Uh, there was uh, a couple of residential properties that I scouted for The Nest, which uh, never came to be. But and again, Dead Water Fell and uh, The Small Hand, we actually filmed in Fintry uh, in parts of Denny, it's, which is a lovely area to, to kind of film in. Uh, a lot of it's actually due to the fact that uh, the, the people are so welcoming uh, more than anything else is as well. Same with uh, the, the Crow Road, uh, the, the road leading to there. It's such a cinematic piece of road. And, and again, I wasn't directly involved in locations at the time, but I remember one of the, the, the films that I did before I moved to that department, which was Stone of Destiny. And I remember filming on that road. Uh, I was a, a production runner at the time and just traveling back and forth. Any time I ever got to go up there, I just, the, the landscapes, the hill views, the country road, the narrowness of it all, it was just very uh, yeah, it's cinematic is the best way I can put that one more than anything else. So, I mean, again, those are a couple of areas in particular. But as I said, uh, the, the Stirling viewpoint holds a, a, a fond memory to me because I, it was the first place I went to when I got my move to the locations department after years of trying. In a corner where two motorways intersect near Stirling stands Bannockburn House, a 17th century mansion with a colourful past. It sits in a location that's been hugely significant for 2,000 years. This house 
It sits next to the Roman road built in the first century AD. That's the Roman road used by every single invasion force from the Romans, through the Vikings, through the Angles, through Wallace, through Bruce, Edward I, Edward II, Cromwell, all the way through to Bonnie Prince Charlie, then being chased by Cumberland. Everybody passed within the immediate area of this. The house was finished in 1675 by Sir Hugh Patterson. There is a Victorian extension, but the majority of this building has stood unchanged for almost 350 years. It's a 17th century roof. It's full of hand-cut timbers. There are oak dowels, there are temp pine planks. Nothing's machine-made. And it's, it's just there, and you are literally going back to the 1670s. One feature that stands out is the ornate work on the plaster ceiling, produced by the same designers who worked on Holyrood Palace. But overpainting in the 1960s and smoke damage from a fire in 1972 demands painstaking restoration. It should be gold and it should be glistening. The building's most famous visitor was Bonnie Prince Charlie, who chose the comfort of Bannockburn House twice during his Jacobite Rebellion. One night here was nearly his last. Both times there is probably some kind of Highland camp around here, the soldiers camping around the area. The second time there is, um, I think, the assassination, an attempted assassination of Bonnie Prince Charlie, a bullet whistled through his bedroom, which is, is up that side. That didn't put the prince off Bannockburn House, not when he had the attentions of the owner's niece, Clementina Walkinshaw. She nursed the prince when he fell ill during his time there, and when the rebellion eventually failed, Clementina joined Charlie abroad to become the mother of his only acknowledged child. But while he was here, Charlie's forces laid siege to Stirling Castle and he was granted the key to the town gate. It was taken to Bannockburn House and when Prince Charlie was later defeated at Culloden, the key was hidden. It remained hidden here through the following years of repression until it resurfaced in an auction during the early 20th century. That was a time of decline for Bannockburn House, but after years of neglect, it was bought by the local community in 2017 with funding from the Scottish Government's Land Fund. And normally we think of it with islands and the West Coast or estates and Aris and islands, but here we have a ruined, a ruined 17th century house and the community using that powerful legislation, using their own uh, determination, their own drive to purchase it. And finally, in January 2020, the volunteers were able to bring back Prince Charlie's key, at least for a while, to celebrate that historic Jacobite link. Now there are ambitious plans for the future, including an epic fundraising campaign to restore Bannockburn House and its garden grounds in a way all the community can enjoy.